uh, Paul Teller with us. Uh, uh, he is the, uh, currently the Special Assistant to the President for Legislative Affairs, and uh, he has been a, uh, the liaison to conservative groups uh, uh, since, uh, uh, you know, during the Trump administration, and we're grateful for the emails that uh, Paul alerts us to what's going on uh, and what's going on. Now, I should say that uh, Paul Teller, yeah, I should call him Dr. Paul Teller, he has a, uh, <laughs> he does have his PhD in political science, uh, and uh, in his background, um, he is, he worked for the Republican Study Committee, and he was Chief of Staff for uh, Senator T Ted Cruz, and please welcome Dr. Paul Teller. Hi, my name is Heather McDonald, would that be? <laughs> I heard that that would be the better person to be right now, right? So. It all depends on the language you're going to be. Oh, well, that's, yeah, okay. That's true. That's true. Yeah, no, I think the architects will have to rebuild the roof because she blew it off from what I hear, right? So that's, that's awesome. She's fantastic. Um, great to see you. So many friends in this room, on this panel. Uh, and, of course, you know, just around, uh, you know, scattered about Eagle Forum World. Really appreciate it. I thought I would just give really just kind of a short update on some of the things we're working on in the White House from the legislative affairs perspective, then we'll turn it over to uh, the, the other uh, more interesting speakers, and you know, we can take some questions from you and stuff like that. Um, first of all, great to be here with everyone who supports Elizabeth Warren. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> oh, wait, it's uh, <laughs> the wrong notes. Uh, actually, today someone said that I remind them of Beto O'Rourke. And they said, well, and they said, what? I said, what? what do you mean? And then I realized, you know, I'm a New York Jewish guy, and I'm always talking like this. You know, so I talk with my hands just like Beto O'Rourke, so I guess that reminded them of that. So anyway, whatever. So anyway, good to, good to be with you. A few main priorities of the president and of ours out of uh, legislative affairs. Big, big, big one, and we know uh, uh, you guys have already helped on this. Hope we'll, hopefully we'll continue to help. USMCA. It's one of those Washington acronyms, but it's the United States, Mexico, Canada trade agreement. It's basically the trade agreement that'll replace NAFTA. You know, the president, once again, keeping his promises, said, we're gonna get rid of NAFTA, not a good deal for the United States. He and his team at uh, the United States Trade Representative negotiated a much better deal, better for ag, better for manufacturing, better for tech, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And Mexico has already ratified it. Canada, I think, is waiting for us to go. And this is going to be an interesting ask, but we need your help, not just in general. Of course, we need it in general to help pass uh, this free trade agreement. But we, um, uh, we especially need help with Democrats. And I know that's a weird ask for, for this uh, particular room, but here's what's interesting. Nancy Pelosi doesn't want to give a win to the president, and this would be a big win for the president if we can, you know, he can walk away with a signature, uh, uh, signature achievement. But uh, right now, Nancy Pelosi doesn't really want to schedule anything that's going to help the president. So we're trying to pressure her through her own Democrats, and we're finding there are some Democrats that are interested in lower tariffs uh, on American goods sold in Canada or sold in Mexico, lower trade barriers between the three countries, that kind of thing. So, uh, but what's even more interesting is some of the Democrats s privately tell us, we're with you, we're going to vote with the president, but don't say that, don't tell anybody. Fascinating, right? Great lesson in politics. So here are members of the elected uh, House of Representatives who are going to vote a certain way but aren't allowed to say so publicly. So anyway, if you happen to have any Democrat contacts or conservative contacts who themselves have Democrat contacts. Perfect example is Mark Meadows, right? Chairman of the House Freedom Caucus. Excellent contacts across the aisle with Democrats. So we're, he's helping us reach out across the aisle. Um, we would love, uh, love your help there. Appropriations, not sure how much you're following that. I know Dave Brad's gonna talk you know, a lot about spending. I won't say too much. This week there was, uh, there's a CR moving through Congress, continuing resolution. That's that, again, a Washington acronym for keeping the government open. And we're not thrilled about it. President didn't want a CR. We were hoping for actual regular order in the appropriations process. But the good news to report is Democrats were threatening to roll back pro-life protections. We held the line. Democrats were uh, threatening to roll back how we could spend money on the border wall, President's border wall signature initiative. We held the line on that. So it's not a wonderful piece of legislation. We're not excited about it. But it held the line on some key priorities um, that conservatives are, of course, following and are interested in and things like that. Um, 
immigration. We're actually, and I know that's obviously a controversial topic. The main focus is border security, the wall, et cetera, et cetera. But we also, the president is also interested in making sure that the folks who do immigrate here legally, more of them, much more of them come on merit you know, for jobs, for education reasons, not just because they have a brother who's here or a sister who's here. Um, that's an initiative we're working on as well so that if, it, if folks do come legally, they are coming because they can contribute to our country. They have a job or a promise of a job or they're coming for educational purposes, things like that. Nominees, some good, good news. Uh, you know, things had been moving slow in the Senate. I know that's a shock, a slow moving Senate, unbelievable. But um, right before the August, the long five week August recess in the Senate, they did about 60 or 65 nominees. They processed through very clearly. And groups like Freedom Works and others have been really putting pressure on uh, Leader McConnell to say, let's do more of the president's nominees. Why is it just the week before a recess that we do a lot? It feels like, you know, when you were in college and you did 19 of your 20 pages of your 20 page paper the night before. That's what this feels like in the Senate, right? They do a lot of nominees right before a recess, right before some sort of deadline or inflection point. Um, we would like to ask for your help in convincing the Senate, no, do more on a regular basis, be in session more, stay in session later each day, schedule more of the president's nominees. There's still about 75 or so that are pending, which is not a terrible number compared to what it had been, but it's still too high. We still gotta move those through a lot of really critical vacancies. And speaking of nominees, we have some great ones just to highlight. Uh, Gene Scalia for the Department of Labor Secretary, the son of the late Antonin Scalia, fantastic conservative. Most labor unions don't like him, which means we love him. Um, he, is, uh, he had a hearing yesterday. We believe he'll be um, uh, on the floor of the Senate next week, we think, to be confirmed as Labor Secretary. But keep your eyes out for that one. Democrats may you know, try to pull some parliamentary shenanigans and, and try to block that. Another one is Michael Pack for BBG, Broadcasting Board of Governors. Sounds small, sounds minor, but if you haven't followed this, there's unfortunately some never Trumpers at BBG who have been using, you know, Voice of America and other things to broadcast anti-Trump things into these communist and totalitarian countries. Just horrible. So we're trying to get our nominee confirmed and in there so he can put a stop to that. So that's just another conservative to kind of follow, out, uh, follow up on, Michael Pack for uh, BBG. And then of course judges, let's face it. That's the ongoing great news uh, in, in the nominees world is we've confirmed, I think it's now 153, it might even be more, 153 Article Three judges have been confirmed under this presidency. Unbelievable number and of course two, yeah, <laughs> exactly, two, um, uh, you know, two conservative Supreme Court justices do we get a chance for a third? I don't know, but wow, if we do, we would really need your help because that's gonna be, you thought Kavanaugh was a fight? I mean, this will make that you know, seem like a voice vote by comparison. So we will really need your help if we get the opportunity to, to nominate and confirm another Supreme Court nomination, uh, nominee. And then frankly, this is the last thing I just wanna point out. This is not necessarily legis, legis hello, hello, legislative affairs thing, but I just have to say it. Two words, Corey, Lewandowski, how great was he the other day? And if you haven't watched it, just grab the clips on YouTube or something. You know, he testified at the Judiciary Committee defending this president, defending himself. It was just fun and fantastic and strong and principled. And for once, it's just so great to see these Democrats get their comeuppance, right? People actually giving it back to them. I mean, they just think they're allowed to dish it out to these witnesses and no one's supposed to take it. There's um, Mr. Congressman, Mr. Congressman. He just gave it right back, so it was fantastic. So we're, that's a long way of saying we're feeling good in the uh, legislative affairs world. A lot of things we're winning on or we think are about to win on. President is not sick of winning. We're gonna keep pushing onward and, uh, and move forward into the fall. And with that, I'll stop and we can take questions a little bit later. Okay. Great, thanks Thank so much, appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is uh, former Congressman Dave Bratt, and uh, he has a Master of Divinity uh, from Princeton Seminary and a Doctorate in Economics from American University. So I think that means he prays for a good economy. 
Uh, but uh, he was served in Congress for uh, two terms from Virginia, uh, and they were exciting, and we actually had uh, someone who believed in fiscal responsibility in Congress, and unfortunately, he's no longer there, but I think he's still, we, we do need a voice for government fiscal responsibility because our budget is out of control. Uh, and he is now Dean of Liberty University School of Business, where I hope he's, treat, uh, he's teaching fiscal responsibility. Well, please welcome former Congressman Dave Bratt. Thank you all very much. It's got a lot of friends going back in this room, and it's just good getting back to the swamp and being with you all. So, yeah, I know, no, I, just, I, I took the train up here. I got to run after my talk, so if, if, I gotta, if you see me hightailing it, there's not a whole lot of trains going to Lynchburg, Virginia. So you, you, you got to take them when you can get them. Uh, but these guys have all been my friend. Genevieve was always a smiling face when we'd go in front of the TV cameras, and she was there hosting us all the time. And Teller is the endless optimist. He's just, he's just boundless energy. And I told him, he said, you want to go first because you got to catch a train? I said, no, I got plenty of time. Plus, I'm, there's no way I'm following Heather McDonald. I said, <laughs> I, said you, I said, you do it, Paul. So he did it, and he always does a good job. And uh, he's the optimist, and I think I'm going to go with Heather on the uh, pessimistic side. I'm a Calvinist, right? So it's uh, kind of the frozen chosen thing. What did the uh, Calvinist say after he fell down the stairway in the morning? Glad I got that over, right? There you go. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And so I'm, I'm, I was assigned the task of talking about the budget deficit and fiscal responsibility and all that. And so I told somebody, I'm going to wait until you, I'm going to do the biggest pivot in, you've ever seen. I'm going to start talking about the deficit, and I'm going to end up talking about God. So your introduction was, was spot on. And the Schaff, Schlafly's I just want to thank. I had a big win five years ago. And I got to go on a boat in, in the Chicago Harbor with Phyllis Schlafly. And my daughter got to meet her, and my mom got to meet her. And, man, it was just a great evening. I'll remember that uh, always. And uh, it's just good to have giants like that, just leading the country, foresighted. They knew, they knew what was coming. She knew what was coming. It's coming. I've been in academia for 25 years. I knew it was coming. When we had Krista, the female Christ, at Princeton Seminary 25 years ago, uh, you know something's come down the road, right? So the Marxists have been doing their job. And so that's my talk. I want to get at that today and uh, give just a little conservative counsel on maybe the best use of our time and resources and energy so we don't waste it. And so I'll just start off with the old budget deficit talk, right? The, if you go to the debt clock, everybody go to the debt clock and you see the thing cranking up and it's whatever, it's $21 trillion or whatever. And then the unfunded liabilities right now, right, for Medicare and Social Security and all that, is about $120 trillion, right? And so that's the crack up. Everyone thinks it's the economy that's going to crack up. I don't really think so, right? I got a bunch of right-wing buddies and my Tea Party guys. And they're saying, Dave, Dave, there's, uh, the economy's going to collapse, right? The, the, the debt, it's all going to collapse. And I say, no, no, no. We got good evidence that you can be pathetic for 40 years. And they said, what's that, Dave? I said, Europe, right? I mean, just look at it, right? I mean, you want to talk about doing everything wrong. Greece is still growing at like at a half a percent, right? Somehow. So you can be pathetic for a long, long time. But growing at zero is painful, right? I mean, when you grow at zero, there's a big difference between zero, one, two, three. After Trump did the tax cuts, we got to 3%. And boy, you could feel the difference, the optimism returning. And uh, so give Teller a round of applause for the, the tax cuts. That was, <coughs> that was a big deal. Uh, I think you know the kind of the key dates. Medicare's hospital trust fund is expected to run out of money in 2026. What is it right now? 20, it's weird. Uh, I always thought it was weird when 2000 came around, right? So it's two, in 2020, and Medicare Hospital Fund 2026 is insolvent, right? That doesn't mean bankrupt, but it means there's not enough cash to pay the bills, and there'll be a real cut, not a Washington, D.C. cut, right? But a real cut in, in benefits. Uh, Social Security, uh, 
warned by 2034, payroll taxes collected will be enough to pay only about 77% of scheduled benefits. Right, so that's a one-fourth cut to Social Security checks going out in 2034. So that's, that's not a financial crisis like 2008, right? That was, everyone was levered up, right? The, the individuals were in debt, the businesses were in debt, the country's in debt. Everyone was levered up, speculating, the housing market caused it all, and crash. And we might have one of those coming as well. I mean, this, thus the pessimism, right? So that, that's all on top of the fiscal government problem. Right, so I taught economics for years, and, and it's very hard to study economics right, right now. Right? The economics is sometimes called the price system. Microeconomics is called price theory, and that relies on markets that are working. Right? So prices convey information about supply and demand. That's, that's what economics is. And right now, when you have $4 trillion on the Fed's balance sheet in funny money, Right? And then a trillion dollar budget deficit, which is more sugar high, right? And we're only growing at 2%. So $4 trillion in sugar high on the Fed balance sheet, a trillion dollar budget deficit. It should be roaring right now, right? This is what they did in the Great Depression, right? To lift you out. So it's so bad that with all of that, we're at two now, right? And I know these guys don't want to say it, but I always tell them, I say, I say, you got to say, look, Trump did the tax cuts and we're growing at 3%, and now the Pelosi takes over the House and we're growing, only growing at 2%. Right? And Trump probably doesn't want to do that because he wants to say, hey, the economy's doing great. But it is noticeable, right? When, as, soon as, the Dem come, as soon as Trump gets in, what's the stock market do? Forward expectations just through the roof. Right? Jock, the stock market just jumps through the roof. And then when the Dems get in, Right? You can just feel just the sluggishness, just kicking, kicking back in. All right, well, <clears throat> that's all you're getting on the deficit. It's bad. Uh, it's bad. I don't see any sign of it turning around. And so the key thing I want to share with you is just some examples to show you why I'm a pessimist on these things. So smart people call me all the time. Dave, I had a Yale guy call me a few weeks ago, old senior guy, real smart. I got an idea for you on, on the deficit. Everyone's always calling me with counsel, right? So, okay, what, what's your idea? And he, oh, da, da. And I said, I said, before we go on, I said, is, does it, is your answer have to do with the people and building up political will, yes or no? He goes, no, but let me, let me tell you my policy idea. I'm going, no. I said, I don't, I, don't, I, I don't have time, right, to go. I said, call me back. We've got to get the political muscle again. And so here's why. So I go to D.C., <clears throat> and we're up there, and Gary Palmer is one of my buddies from Alabama. Got some Alabamians in here. And him and me and a few other guys, uh, he found $40 billion we're paying to dead people in the budget. So we thought, well, if you're paying $40 billion to dead people, you can probably find a more efficient use of that money. I'm dr you young people can laugh. These are jokes, right? So <laughs> this is the best Calvinists can do, right? So you're, you're paying $40 billion to dead people. That's probably not the best use of your tax funds, right? So we asked Paul Ryan, can we get a meeting? And Paul finally, Paul's a nice guy, right? I totally disagreed with him on a ton of stuff. So we get me and Gary and some other guys, and then we found another 80. So we had $120 billion uh, in just total easy softball saving. We go to Paul, hey, Paul, can we take this $120 billion and put it toward a deficit? Paul says, oh, well, let me go check on that. That was a joke, <laughs> right? If, if you're critical thinkers, which you all appear to be sleeping after your nice lunch, <clears throat> right? What's funny about that? When the Speaker of the House, who I like personally, and he's a nice Catholic guy, and da-da-da-da-da, when he says he's got to, who's he checking with? He's the boss. <laughs> Have you heard of the Constitution, Article 1? You know who makes the budget? Paul Ryan. You know what he spent his whole life on? Fiscal responsibility, right? So who's he checking with? And I hate, this is the answer, and he's checking what I call the giant Excel spreadsheet in the sky. Right? The Democrats say yes to everything, so when you go cut, that $40 billion ain't just sitting there free, and it's going to somebody. Right? And that somebody's got friends and whoever and whatever, and they give money to us, and we're all getting smoked right now. Right? The Democrats offer endless free goods, and then they got money coming out of the clouds. They spent $13 million against me. And so Paul says, I'm going to go check on it. He comes back and says, no, we can't do it. 
And then it's like some, I don't know, some, I don't know, who's behind the green curtain. Like, you just know better than to ask why. <laughs> you know, but I'd say, why? <laughs> well, Dave, it's complex. I'm like, okay, good. Well, I'm moving on. Right? And so that, that's where we are. And so then all my conservative buddies and everyone in this room will say, Dave, we go to the meeting. We got to do a uh, balanced budget amendment. After I tell them a story like that, <clears throat> well, that's a joke. Right, and I'm for balanced budget amendments, obviously. Right, but what I what I just tell you is there any way in high heaven we're going to save forty billion dollars? You know how much the deficit is? Over a trillion. You young people, how many zeros in a trillion? Put you on. Yes, very good. Twelve zeros, right? It's a lot more than forty billion. Right, it's a lot more than four hundred billion. Right, so the same people that say after I get done telling them we couldn't save $40 billion that we pay to dead people, conservatives are coming up and telling me we've got to spend all of our time and energy doing a balanced budget amendment to save a trillion dollars per year. Is that going to happen? No. And that's why I said the solution is the people, right? You, you better get first principles and some energy back in your veins, and we lost it, right? It was, better, it was easier to be mad at Obama and, and whatever, and that pumped us up. But right now, it, we, we still don't, the left's clearly got the energy right now. Right, and Trump is just a unique figure, right? He can do it, right? He's got the, the bullhorn and the outsized leadership skills. I mean, he, this guy is just, the rest of us would be sawdust, right? In that position, Cruz, I like Cruz, I like Rand, but there's no way, right? Trump is just, we're just lucky to have him. I think God did just, right, just to torment the liberals. <laughs> and he's just bigger than life, right? So however that works. And so other ideas, right, so I did that one, and then other people say, well, what about term limits, right? And I'm just telling you this because I'm trying to save you all energy when you go back home and work on whatever you're going to work on. Uh, term limits, let's go over that one. Uh, when you go up to D.C., they say, how long does it take them to ask me, hey, Dave, are you on the team, yes or no? The first day, Right? If you're not on the team, the NRCC gave me how much money in my last election that I lost? Zero. Zero. You doing the math with me here? <laughs> I was not on what you call A committees. When you're on A committees, you get checks for sleeping at night. They just come in. You get up in the morning and there's the checks. I, would not, I was on the education committee. There's a real hard charger. Right? The budget committee, where they tell you the answer at the beginning of the year and tell you just get there by the end of your time here. I'm not making that up. And what else was I on? The small business committee. Right? <clears throat> so those are all B and C, and that's you're in the doghouse because I beat the majority leader and he was going to be the speaker, and I blew up about a million, million dollar deals. Sorry, didn't know that. <laughs> right? That was an accident. <laughs> you're starting to catch on. You're finally. <laughs> You're finally warming up. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> so that's that. <clears throat> so I wrote a book way back then after I won. It's called American Underdog. I forgot. I never really pushed it because I was too busy going to all these budget meetings. <laughs> and that book I, I still think is true. I'm glad I wrote it. And it said three pillars made us great. Uh, and they are the in theory and in history, they happen in the same order. The Judeo-Christian tradition, first and foremost, without that, you don't get the rest of it. It's abs and it's true. I mean, it's just theoretically it's true, historically it's true. I'll prove that to you beyond a shadow of a doubt. <clears throat> and then out of the Judeo-Christian tradition, you get the rule of law. You may have heard of a man named Moses. When Paul Ryan sits in his chair, all those busts around the thing, there's only one that stares straight at him, and that is Moses. And then you get the rest of it, right? And I'll get to that in a minute. And then if you're really lucky, you get another Presbyterian, <laughs> Adam Smith, kind of, pretty close to Presbyterian, right? And you get to be the wealthiest society in the earth. And every capitalist country at first was a Christian country, right? And women's rights and rights language only came out of Christian countries, right, so I can just go on and on and on, right, and it's like it's boring being right all the time, and it's like, how can we lose when we're right on everything? We have the right, right, and we just don't have the people, so how can, it's education, right, that's, that's the key, and so we got to get back at it, 
And so let me give you a little bit on, uh, well, so what's the left been doing? So I said those are the three pillars that made us great. And for 40 or 50 years at Harvard and Yale and Princeton, whatever, the left has been doing what? Their only school of philosophy right now is called deconstruction, right? And you all need to write on this. The left, if you're ever in a debate, ask any leftist, can you please name any thought leader that you follow? If, if it's a philosopher or a theologian or a politician, and there, there's none, Right? This, I mean, it's embarrassing for them. So they got a few people, you know, Jacques Derrida and Foucault and all these guys, the deconstructionists. Well, they're, they're the, the left, in, in my easy analysis, is that they are psychologically in a rage against upstairs. They're like this, right? So then if you look at what comes out of that, what philosophy or theology or everyone says, they don't have a plan, they don't do it. Well, no, they do. And they're raging against God. And so then what do you do? You deconstruct the order. They don't like rules. They don't like discipline. They don't like order. And so you tear apart religion. But they were, they were clever. They did that last. Right? You don't dare do that one first. Right? They knew. And so you tear apart the Judeo-Christian tradition. You can't teach it in uh, K-12, to higher ed. They laugh and mock Right? That's Heather's whole case. They, they mock the Christian tradition right now or the Jewish tradition. Uh, and then pillar two, the rule of law, cops, right? Heather was talking, right? They're deconstructing the rule of law. They're tearing it down. Authority is bad. And then finally markets. And they shift. And one of the reasons we're really losing elections is because our business people have now been scared and threatened by the left. That's new, right? So it's bad enough when you lose uh, all the hospital system people are going socialist just for survival. They need the money. All the teachers, all the left special interest groups, the charitable stuff, the nonprofits, right? And then, so that's bad enough. And the labor unions and all that stuff. Then you, then you lose, you start losing business people because they start getting jittery. Like I might lose some of my consumers, my customers, and we're in trouble. Right? So that's the leftist project. And so I emailed one of my conservative buddies back from college in Grand Rapids, Michigan. A bunch of Calvinists over there, a bunch of Dutch people. <laughs> Any Michiganders in here? And he said, oh, very good. And so he said, there you go again, Dave, just a real downer. <laughs> and you, he says, in a business meeting, you got to offer people hope. you got to give them something. Right? And so I said, well, geez, oh, Pete, what do you think? I'm talking about God. That's as positive as I get. Right? That's what I'm offering. Right? So let me do a quick little whirlwind tour of history. Right? So our Hebrew patriarchs, and I think you all know that, right? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, the Ten Commandments, all of that, the prophets, right? They give you Hebrew text. Jesus says, don't change any of that. Don't change the law or you're in big trouble. Right? So that brings you up to zero. And then at zero, I had some of my Randolph Macon students when I used to teach didn't know what happened in zero. <laughs> For real. This is how bad it is. So I say, well, when you were born, did the calendar change to zero? <laughs> I said, no. Well, I said, well, something big must have happened <laughs> at zero. <laughs> right? So I said, this is Jesus both. God and man, if you're a Presbyterian. And then you got the early church does all the creeds. We're all creedal, right? And you think about our modern political language. It all comes out of that creedal stuff. Uh, free, free will, where do you think that came from? Freedom of conscience, right? God could have made robots, didn't. We have free will, right? So you get the creeds. You go up to 300, and this is quite amazing. There, here's your little hope, right? So I'm supposed to be positive and give you some hope. So 300 years later, after Jesus, the Christians somehow are running the Holy Roman Empire without planning it, right? With Constantine. Constantine shifts over, and it's the first Holy Roman Emperor. 
Right? So that, that's what I'm trying to teach if I'm getting any lesson through here. It's you first do the fundamentals, and then somehow, if you, do the, if you have the right thing in your gut, and then the Hebrews and the Jewish intellectuals, you get it in your mind, right? It's, there's not a separation. Stuff's going to happen if you get that in the people, and we're not doing that anymore, right? And so be careful in your own literature and all that. Make sure you get, don't say, you know, values and this, right? Judeo-Christian, I mean, be explicit about it. So then 300, we get Rome. Then by 400, Rome fell because it was corrupt. And then you get St. Augustine. And then 800, you get Charlemagne, the second Holy Roman Empire. And then 1200, you get the Magna Carta. Anybody heard of this? Levin was going off the other day on the Magna Carta, the importance of them. Everybody hear that? Did you hear him going off on the importance of that one? Just that alone, right? This is a lecture. And then right there, we founded Harvard. I mean, not, we founded Oxford and Cambridge. You've heard of these universities. They're fairly significant, right? So there's Western Civ, the Trivium, the Quadrivium, the liberal arts education reemerges from the Greeks and the Romans, and then you get to the Renaissance, which we managed, right? We managed the Renaissance, and then you get the Reformation, which we did, Luther and, and Calvin, who's the greatest of all times. <laughs> Go Calvin. And even the sociologists say, right, the, the Reformers dwarf the Renaissance in terms of historical significance, right? So the Reformation is it. And Karl Marx there's a quote, and I can't find it. I look for it forever. Marx said, once Calvin democratized the church pews, it was all over. Right? That's it. That's the Western trajectory until we fail in the church. And that's what this little talk is about. If you ever want to fix the deficit, you better get this thing straight. Right? The first principles. So then 1450 and 60, Renaissance, Reformation, the Enlightenment we managed... Right? Uh, Jefferson, he's good. He's overrated. <laughs> Madison's better. Madison went to what school? Princeton Seminary, where I went. <laughs> Starting to get a little theme here. Stuck around, was the first graduate student in <clears throat> Hebrew. Hebrew. In the Hebrew scriptures, how long, how long did it take humanity to do a belly flop? How many chapters? Yeah, three, close enough. Three, Genesis 3. Creation, fall. 66 books of redemption follow the fall. Thank God. The fall was fairly serious, right? This I differ with my Catholic brother. They all go Aristotle on me. Well, there's a golden mean. I said, there's no mean. It's bad. It's human nature is bad, 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 bad. How do you know the fall is bad? Because of the flood. <laughs> right? That's a little evidence of how bad. No, Aristotle, it's not a golden mean where we're just off a little bit, buddy. We're way off. Right? So we manage all of this, and then you get up to modernity, and we found Harvard. Harvard, in 1620, the motto was what? Truth for Christ and church, just like today. <laughs> Harvard, Yale, Princeton, if you want to read on that stuff, go read Marsden, the soul of the American University, Notre Dame Press, from Protestant establishment to established unbelief. Heather, Heather's talk. From Protestant establishment to established unbelief. Right? So now it's established unbelief. Right? And then you finally get to the Third Reich, which was Adolf Hitler, who claimed to be Christ, right? And took over most of Europe until the USA comes in and saves the day as always. Yes, and sets up the modern liberal order, right? The Bretton Woods liberal order, the World Bank, the IMF, the United Nations, all this kind of stuff and provides peace and prosperity for the next 50 years, right? And we were Christian in our attitude toward our arch enemies, the Nazis. Now they're our friends. They were our friends. They don't pay their fair share of the bills. So our president goes over to Europe and says, 
Boy, I love Trump, man. <laughs> he goes over on that stage, and if I was not in polite company, I'd, he gave them the, I don't know, something. He gave them a piece of his mind. He, right? I mean, the size of this guy to go, right? I get nervous getting in front of a crowd. He goes to Europe, tells them all they're wimps. <laughs> Pay up, do your fair share. That's absolutely correct. Right? They've been wimping out for a long time. He goes over there and says, get it, let's, you're pathetic. They know they're pathetic. And if they ever unite with us, right, so people then, people say, oh, Trump, he's causing division. Oh, yeah, it's his fault, right? I mean, 50 years of disaster. He's bringing us together against the, and, and the Japanese, right? We're friends with the Japanese. It's a very Christian attitude, right? So your enemies kill you and you make friends with them and now we're trading and we're all rich together. Except for who? Who doesn't know what a win-win looks like? China. They don't get it. They don't got it in their head. Right? So we better all get together and play hardball. And then everyone's, oh, Dave, you're a free trader. You've got, you know, you got to be anti-tariffs. Well, I am for economics. But there's a higher order than just pure economic efficiency, right? Geopolitics and whatever. This is a big power game. And Trump, I think, has it right on this. Right? And I wish he would do everything else, right? Go uh, shut down the New York Stock Exchange, shut down Hong Kong dollar trade, do everything. You taking notes on this? Yeah. All right, good. <laughs> All right. I think I made it through everything. So I could go off on more, right? The rule of law, free markets, economics, and you'd be here for another half hour. Uh, but there's no need. What, I, what did I just try to do? I always forget to summarize. Everyone gets lost, including myself. I just tried to show you that almost empirically, there is no other tradition than the Judeo-Christian tradition. Every philosopher of note was within the bounds, right? The greats, the utilitarians. If you go by an MBA textbook, they teach you all irrelevant ethics. There's Aristotle, virtue theory. There's the utilitarians, Mill and Bentham. And there's Kant, the, great, the greatest philosopher. And, you know, you were having the abortion debate earlier. Kant gave the classic enlightenment view on the value of a life, and he couldn't do it. And that's why his system failed. That's why there's no, any Kantians in here that live your life out on Kantian ethics? He's the greatest ethicist ever, period. Right? He's, he basically took the Judeo-Christian system and made it secular, right? Not with all these intellectual rules and all. He's a genius, right? So he's great. But there's no Kantians because he said his definition of humanity, why, why should we value a human? And Kant's great answer is that uh, you should value humans because humans do the valuing. Okay, that's clever, but it's, boy, I want to get out of bed every morning there. Right? Great. I'm going to go run five miles because you pumped me up so good. I don't think that works, right? The reason human beings are valuable is because God is our father, and God created us in his image, and that's a big deal if you think about that for a minute. We're created in the image of God, and we're all brothers and sisters, and that's a big deal. And there's no competing vision to that one in this thing, even the Europeans or whatever. I, I could rattle off joke. I used to go to Europe with the kids, and I was going to tell you where I sat. I'm not going to tell you that. So I'd get into it with these Europeans. They, oh, yeah, you Mar- I don't like America. Why not? Well, you don't take care of the poor. You're all stingy, blah, blah, blah. you don't take care of the poor like we do, and you're, you don't care. And I said, well, where did you get the crazy idea that you should take care of the poor? He goes, what? And I said, well, where did you get the crazy idea you ought to take care of the poor? He goes, well, I don't know. I said, it's just common sense. He said, I said, are you a great churchman? I could tell he was an atheist. Right? So I was bugging him. Are you a great churchman? Are you a great follower of the church? No. Well, then... Where are you getting this idea that I should take care of the poor? Well, I don't know. It's just, it's just all around us. You should take care of the poor. So they don't know, right? They've got the Judeo-Christian thing in them so deep, they don't even know what they got in them. Right? There is no alternative thing. It's real, right? I mean, the creation, why is there something instead of nothing? It's a good question, right? Your leftist buddies have to answer that. Right, so they want to push you toward all these other arguments. Just ask them, why is there something instead of nothing? They got nothing. They got nothing. They got zero, and we're losing. That's 
That's the scary part. So we, my words of encouragement are just to show you how grand that tradition is. Was that positive a little bit? So you feel a little, I did something good, right? So that's your positive, P, and then you got to go out and sell it. Go out into the world and preach the good news because it's a winner, right? So Eagle Schlafly people, <laughs> honored to be with you. I'm going to go catch a train. I'm going to sit here for a little bit until I get settled again. But uh, God bless you. It's been great being with you. I hope you understood something of what I said. Thank you. I pity the students in Dave Brad's theology class. <laughs> I'm going to open it up for questions for uh, Paul Teller and Dave Brad, and I'm going to start off with going, you know, back to earth on a little bit, uh, because I understand that um, some of our friends in um, Congress and some people in the administration think that there would be a really good idea to have a brand new entitlement program which is taxpayer paid family leave. So I would like both of you to comment on taxpayer paid family leave. Hmm. I guess I need to start with that, right? Since that's coming out of, uh, wow. Um, God's honest truth, it is still being discussed. In other words, there is not something that we are rolling out or that is forthcoming. It's something that, for example, Ivanka Trump is leading that mm -hmm. effort some she believes in passionately, but she has heard from the conservative world that taxpayer-funded paid leave is not something that conservatives are going to love and therefore a lot of members of Congress are not going to love. So she very much um, is also hearing ideas for voluntary paid leave, where in other words, encouraging corporations to do it on their own, but not Isn't to have the government Isn't that what Bill Clinton it. did? Um, I don't know, actually. I think, um, I think what she's looking at is similar to what she has been doing with um, apprenticeships. In other words, going around meeting with corporations and not saying, you must do this, but just saying it would be great if voluntarily you created apprenticeship programs or you created um, worker training programs. No taxpayer dollars, just using you know, the kind of power of her, her office, her prestige uh, to encourage that. So I think she's more on the encouragement side now and less on the taxpayer mandated as far as I understand but I will put on the card here to go check to make sure well Dave I think there's there are some proposals in Congress that the idea of dipping into Social Security to pay for uh, t uh, family leave you have uh, I th think that might blow up the deficit a little, even a yeah, little you bit might as well than... implode quickly instead yeah. of over a decade <laughs> Y'all watch Lord of the Rings. That's that's what's coming, right? Eating, living under bridges, eating trout in streams. Frodo. So the answer is James Madison. The answer is no, you can't do it. They want to do it because the left is clobbering us, right? Suburban women in my district and the other districts, the left offers everything for free, free college, free this, free that, free everything, right? And so my response to that is Republicans, we know that every city they run is a disaster, right? It's all over now, LA, San Fran, and that's not good enough. At what we Republicans have to have a shining city on a hill. We need a city, one, that's run on Judeo-Christian principles and ideas and whatever. And like for me, the church and the synagogue is just the perfect labor market. You got the poor people in there, you got the CEO in there. How in the world aren't we all helping each other find jobs and be successful and skill up the kids, right? So you, you, you need some Republican city, just one that gets it right. And then on education, all the funding, it's 14 grand per kid per year for 13 years, right? And so you own your school boards. So a city can do it. The state gives a little bit, the feds give a little bit, right, to K to 12, but K to 12, you got five people on a school board, go win three, and then go turn your city around. And go train the kids in so that it's so competitive that you don't need all this government programs, right? The reason you need programs is because the economy stinks and they've socialized everything. And then you got to go onto these programs to make up 
for the distortion that the left's caused throughout the whole economy, right? So they do one distortion that ruins things, and then you need another distortion to fix that distortion, and that's what we're in the middle of a vicious loop. We got to get out of that loop, right? And so just go out into your cities, take over the school board, skill them up, the churches, synagogues, labor market, you know, get people helping each other out. That's the Republican principle, right? Solve it at the local level first if you can. And if we do that, then everyone will point to that city in five seconds and we're going to copy that. Let's copy that. So we got it. We need a winner. So you Alabama people where there's still some normal people left or whoever's here, Michigan and Tennessee or whoever, right? Go do it any day now. We need one big data point where you do it, everything right. Go ahead. Thank you. You are wonderful. I wish it was that easy. Yeah, we've no. been, we've oh, been fighting. In I didn't say it was easy. For, I'm a Calvinist. one school board member. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, so my dilemma here, I've been, I'm a very old lady now, and I was fighting this fight when I was these young kids' age. And... Um, we just keep getting worse. And the, and the strides we've made to the evil side have been so great and are so grievous now that I can almost not even speak because they're so horrible. So here's my question to you. Everybody I know is giddy over President Trump, which tells you what a small number of people <laughs> I know. And everybody I know sees how insane yeah a direction our country is going in. N nobody would admit that it has sanity in it. But there, it seems like there must be these hordes of, when you talk about the hobbits, there must be hordes of ghost people out there running the universities and, all, and, and for you to say that the universities are afraid of the, all these people sound like they're afraid. Is there no, is there no spine anywhere in all of America anymore to just stand up to sense? I don't know where all these people are. What's the balance? Thanks. It, really. Who wants to take that one on? <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that, that's the issue. If you dare stand up, you will get annihilated. Right? Business people who stand up get annihilated. The church is under massive attack from everybody. Politico. Go read. Right? Just they own the press. They own the ink. Politico, The Hill, Roll Call. We get those three up in our office every day. Those three frame the debate every day, all day. And you just you open it up, and you're just praying your name's not in there, right? Because they just make it up. They literally just make, I had three ethics cases lodged against me the month of my election. Right? That just That's shows just you, you, you've, you've, you've done some good yeah, you've because done you've something. made enemies. Right, mm -hmm. right. So you've done something, but that – and then – I thought it was funny, right? I mean, I, I, I didn't mind. I had good buddies up there, and Paul's a good buddy. But uh, when you got a little girl back at home, yeah. and she goes into school and gets pilloried yeah. by mean kids, and the parents aren't disciplined in those kids, then you're back to your question, and how did that happen? And I gave you the answer in my lecture. <laughs> Sandy, you have a question? Yeah, Dave, uh, now that you're dean of economics at Liberty, I'm just curious to know, how you're shifting that program, because I'm assuming that most uh, economics programs are not, they're Keynesian now, they're not, uh, they're not what you teach. So if, if you, I'm sure you have a plan for this program, what would it look like? And do you think your kids are already being effective? And where do you see them going and the impact that that's going to have on the culture? Yeah, no, that's great. It's not, I'm not doing anything. They shut it up. They, they weave the Judeo-Christian tradition into every single course all day, every day. They open up every meal with prayer, every class with prayer. They pray throughout the class. Uh, they show how God's at work every day. The kids are nice. I get in front of the kids and say, I went from D.C. where everybody lied to this place. Right? I mean, it's like I'm pinching myself. And so now we're just, you know, the Falwell Sr. And, and, and Junior both strive to be the Notre Dame right, out here of, of the Protestants, right? So the quality level, the, the do, getting our name out more and more, enhancing the quality better and better and better. Our sports are getting better and better. The kids are getting better. Our law school, the pass rates are top in the country, I think top seven. I think we beat UVA. The med school has 90% placement to residencies. So we're just doing steady, steady 
steady, steady work. And then educating the kids in political science and whatever. I mean, it's one of the few places, like Heather mentioned, where you can Hillsdale and Liberty, where you, you don't have to worry what you say. I mean, it's just an unbelievable place. Send everybody you know our way. And tell your rich friends to quit giving to Brown and Harvard and, right? Yeah. Oh, sorry, Lou, I'm, I'm actually looking for some free economic advice on what you or Calvin, either one, think about, <laughs> <laughs> about a fair tax. Alabama has a pre-filed fair tax bill, so I just wanted to know that. And I'm sorry that you've had um, some accusations. I didn't know that. But the playbook is bear false witness against your neighbor. That's the yeah. playbook. Yeah, well, uh, tax, tax stuff. Yeah, no, any 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 tax that gets rid of distortions, gets rid of special treatment for everybody, right? The new game in town, right? All the rich counties here. If you pay a million dollars for a lobbyist, it's a bargain, because they change one comma in the code and they, you're a billionaire. You pay a million, you get a billion. You rule out competition, right? That's why you're changing the code, the tax code. So you're a monopoly. You're protecting yourself. So the rich are getting richer, right? We do have a gilded age, right? The inequality is incomprehensible. And then they have the gall to blame it on the free market system. I ha Joe Kennedy used to come up to me every day. Hey, Dave, you found a free market up here yet? <laughs> he knew. It's just a joke. There's no free markets, right? The federal government's $4 trillion a year. That's just in spending. Then what they control through law and regulation, they run the whole economy. Name one, I used to teach to my kids. I said, name me one part of a house, right? It's got 10,000 pieces to it. Name me one part of a house that's not regulated. One piece. And if you can't come up with that, you know you got disaster. So anything that gets rid of as much of that, and it'll never happen until there's a revolution from beneath, from the people, right? And it, that's what's got to happen. Start it up. Good. Cal. Good. Yeah, um, a friend of mine, John Bodden, whom you might know, uh, proposed 25 years ago uh, the creation of what he called the predatory agency mm -hmm. in the administration. And you were, you were emphasizing that solutions to the deficit have to be things that are going to win with the people. Seems to me that the idea of the predatory agency, which is an agency whose budget consists of a percentage of what it persuades Congress to cut from other agencies, right? Which necessarily means that, that insofar as it's successful, government has to shrink even as that agency grows. Seems to me that that's something that could be sold to the people. What do, what do both of you think about that idea? So I'll let you go, go first. Well, go, go. No, I, actually, I'm not sure. I, 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 don't have, I don't have a clear answer for you. I apologize. That, I mean, it's got to get through the House and the Senate and whatever become law to have an agency mm -hmm. like that. That's, yeah, that's, that's, probably, that's it's it's probably not. So it's, yeah. you got to have a real motivator and telling him the, the, if I'm going to try to create a cheerleading squad, that's, I'm not going to sell an agency. Yeah. That try, I just don't think it, it's jazzy enough. But I'm waiting for ideas. I mean, something's just got to organically have come up where people get so ticked off of what's happening to your kids. That's a, that's a hint as to what I think is coming. Right? This thing, the libertarian, there's a libertarian strand in our party, which I like all those guys, whatever, but they, you know, <laughs> so it's like everything will work out. No, in fifth grade, you know, you're going to teach a little course. There's young people in the room, so I won't go into it. But, you know, is there one option there or are there a couple options? Right? Because you're going to have to make up your mind on that, right, for how everything works. Right? So there's, I think the average mom is, doesn't know what's really going on in the school system yet. And my, my guess is something like that's going to lead the spark, right? There's so, it's because it's crazy. Cindy, you have a question? Yeah, I would like to go back to the family leave thing okay, as yeah. a dedicated stay-home mom who told everybody I dated, hi, second date, you want to date me again? I will stay home. I am not <laughs> an income for you. You know, I'm going to do politics, but I'm going to be at home with our children. <laughs> Um, so, so this That's burns awesome. me when, you know, when they're talking about taking our money yep. and paying for other people to stay home because the premise is it's good to go home for a while when you have a child. So why isn't the bigger idea it is good for a parent to be at home right. when you have children? Yeah. yeah. So, 
you know, I, I understand that, you know, President Trump has raised some really go-getter kids. I wish the moms were go-getters at home um, and not out in the working world. But um, I am just, you know, you have got to explain to them yeah, that it's point. socialism to take from us to give to people who are, you know, doing differently than what we choose to do. We're in a free country, and I can't be penalized and pay for other people to have more income than me. So. <laughs> Good point. Last question, Karen. Um, thank you. Thank you both for your speeches. Good to see you. Um, and for what you're doing. My grave concern is the amount, the exponential loss of data privacy and the move toward the Chinese social credit system that is happening with every app that we have. Google is in the schools. Google is trying to um, to predict the next uh, mass shooter. <laughs> um, <coughs> you have curriculum companies suing a parent for speaking out against Common Core math curriculum. You have um, the NAEP doing social emotional learning and school climate surveys, which is clearly against federal law, but nobody is holding them accountable. Is, is there a question, Karen? What can we do about it? <laughs> okay, who wants to take that one? Well, from the president's perspective, extremely concerned about all of those issues, but spe specifically the data privacy one. I don't know if you saw, we did a White House summit on that, brought a lot of folks together. Uh, we have executive orders that are directing different agencies to kind of look into what to do. Uh, our uh, Department of Justice is looking into antitrust actions, possibly with some of these co uh, companies. So we'll see. I don't know what's exactly going to come of it, but this president's taking action because he's heard loud and clear the, the problems of, uh, of data privacy, no question. That's great to hear. Thank you. Any well, thank you to uh, um, Dave and uh, Paul for Absolutely. your Thanks representations. For thank you very much. We're going to. Uh, Which one? I, I think we have one more question here from our president. Oh, good. Okay. Yes. Dave, would you, Congressman Bratt, would you please comment on uh, the possibility of an Article Five constitutional convention? Oh, wow. Oh, she Come gets on. me on that one. Now that I'm out of office, I can answer that easier. Yes, you can do it. The answer to a con-con is it sounds neat, uh, but you're going to have Democrat leadership with Nancy Pelosi ag up against our leadership, and I told you about $40 billion to dead people. <laughs> do you want to open up the Constitution of the United States of America for debate with that head-to-head -head no. smackdown? when they own the media, and they're going to create a groundswell, and I don't think you want to go that way. But, but, I'm still a politician. I have friends on the <laughs> other side, and like when I, I, you're going to, some people are going to walk out of here and misinterpret me, and they're, oh, Brat said he's against uh, balanced budgets. Brat wants an unbalanced budget. Brat said he's against term limits. He wants powerful oligarchs in charge. No. I just said, you ain't going to get that. Right? So I want all these things. I would love the Constitution to change, uh, but you don't open it up when you're fighting these people with bigger guns than we got. Okay. Our next speaker is Genevieve Wood. <laughs> and Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm letting him catch his train down to Lynchburg so the swamp doesn't uh, swamp him again. Um, the, uh, Genevieve uh, is a 